So a couple days ago was March 11th, which was the eight year anniversary of the tsunami that hit this town. And it was kind of weird that day because um, leading up to the day, it was really sunny and warm and stuff. And then that day, for some reason, it was just pouring. Um, and it was raining all day and the sky was dark. And then, and then the next day was all sunny again. So it was kind of like, to me it was like, it looked like it was reflecting everybody's like heart. And, you know, I think everybody's mind was on that. And, um, but the weird thing also was that it, how kind of invisible that is. Um, we live in the part of the town that wasn't hit by the tsunami. So living here, you know, we just came here at the end of last year and it just looks normal, feel normal, and nobody talks about um, the tsunami or anything anymore. And so it's, it just kind of um, doesn't feel like it, anything like that happened. As many of you know, our original intent was to go to Tokyo. We were raising support. We were planning to go to Tokyo to do church planting. And in the middle of that support raising process, uh, the tsunami hit. And we felt that God was calling us to change our plans and to come here. Um, uh, we thought he might do something. Uh, this might be the start of a, a new work, a new opportunity to bring his love to these people who um, needed it so desperately. You know, I was thinking about it, and then it occurred to me that um, so Titus, our our oldest son, is he was born in November of that same year. So that means everybody in his class, all his classmates, their parents were either pregnant with them when it happened, or they just had the baby, or that the baby was just a couple months old. And just thinking about how hard it must have been for for them, and you know, because I see the parents all the time and they don't talk about it and they just act normal but you know they did go through that so it was kind of like wow to me and and then also that means that anybody who's older than Titus have all experienced it and they all watch their um, town get in, get destructed and everything and then anybody who's younger than him they're never going to know what the town used to look like before the tsunami or how it used to be um, before because this town just changed completely forever and it's never going to be the same. It feels kind of odd the way that people seem to look at the ocean because here in, in this town it plays such a huge part in the livelihood of the city. The, the two main industries in Miyako are, are fishing and tourism and Miyako is known for having one of the, the most beautiful beaches in Japan. And fishing is a, is a huge industry here. That's what many of the people are employed in the fishing industry. But now at the same time, it feels like there's a, a fear of the, of the ocean. It's this weird emotional and psychological thing to see these massive walls between you and the ocean. And what used to be this, this beautiful, majestic view is now completely blocked off by these giant walls to try and keep the town safe from the, the threat of future tsunamis and of the ocean rising up and washing into the town again. There are signs all throughout the city marking how high the water rose, marking where the, the area of the city was previously covered in the tsunami so that people would know that this, this place, this part of the city is not safe. It's been eight years since the tsunami, but when you go through these neighborhoods, you still see now um, you know, where there used to be just uh, a place completely packed with houses, um, there's these open lots and there's some houses that have been rebuilt but others haven't and it's this sort of um, odd patchwork of, you know, cleaned up land that's empty and people who have kind of come back and rebuilt their houses um, in this area and you get the sense that, you know, a lot of people are probably thinking you know, that this is not a safe place to live anymore and they're, they're looking for other places. People don't really want to talk about it much anymore. They want to move on and they have to have have to go back to normal and they have to um, be strong and they don't want to identify themselves as, as, as victims anymore. They need to move on. Yeah, so as we were going around the town filming some video and taking some pictures to show you guys, uh, we came, I was with the, two of the kids and we, we came across one of the evacuation route signs saying, you know, 100 meters this way is where you can go where it's safe. Yeah, so we decided to kind of take a little walk and follow the sign and see where it led. 
uh, we went up this really narrow staircase and at the top of it uh, we got to this kind of flat hill and it was just this open area that had been cleared as an evacuation zone and it was just a beautiful view you could see the the ocean and you know all the the hills and everything but then you could also see down below where the the town used to be and you could see again those vacant lots and the houses that had been rebuilt and the ones that hadn't and I, yeah, I just, I just could imagine that this was probably a place that many people fled to when the tsunami hit. And they, they just watched in shock as the, the water came through. And for us that day, and sort of, you know, for the kids, they didn't know any better. It was just a kind of a fun little time to be out in nature. But for the people eight years ago who gathered in the same spot and ran from the tsunami, um, I can only imagine what they went through or are still going through. I feel like people feel like if they didn't, um, have it the worst they're not really allowed to talk about it like if you didn't like absolutely lo uh, lose everything then you 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 don't really want to say oh it was hard for me because you feel like there are people who had it much worse than you so all these things um, I think affect how people just don't like they just act like it didn't happen but, you know, what if they're, they are not ready to move on? You know, what if they're all still struggling? And I think they are. But the challenge for us as a church in this town is just um, how to find those people and how we can reach out to them and how we can connect with them so we, we can um, help in that um, process of grieving and mourning. And um, so, yeah, I am, if people can pray that we can find ways to find those people and get connected with them. Um, yeah, that'll be a huge um, prayer. So please continue to pray for Japan. Pray, pray for our city. Pray for Miyako. Pray that God will establish a new church here and that through this church that he'll share his love with the people here. And pray that we'll have the wisdom to know how to reach out and how to show that love and share that love. Every year on March 11th, the people here on the coast and in many places of Japan, they look back and they remember um, the devastation and the tragedy, but they also look at the progress and they look at how things have been going. And I think we as Christians, we do the same thing. And our hope is that what started in this terrible, devastating thing, that each year will, will bring a, a greater uh, revelation of God's glory and brightness and hope and light um, into this dark situation.